Hey guys, it's Matt here. Um, so as promised on the Chelsoft update five, um, sort of earlier in May, um, <clears throat> I'm going to offer up some reflections on, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the the Donald Hoffman interview. And, uh, you know, I, th I might do this over a sort of two parts. Um, I mean, there may be just ongoing thoughts. Um, so, so there may, you know, there, there, there may be, um, sort of no end <laughs> to, 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 you know, sort of, uh, commentaries and reflections on some of these fantastic thinkers. Right. Um, because, you know, obviously our view at Chelsoft, my view, um, personally, and the work of these characters is, is ever evolving. And, um, so should the commentary regarding such, um, so what, what what do I want to say first? So the first thing to say about Donald is that he's just a fantastic human being. He's so humble, he's approachable, he's patient. Um, he's sort of he can see all sides of the argument, and he respects his um, detractors. If you know people people that um, you know sort of don't you know he, he respects physicalists. He respects he respects everybody. I mean he's just a really really decent human being, and it's just so great to see that. Um, sort of kindly conduct, um, you know, in, in, in the field. So, um, that, that's the first thing to say. And, you know, again, he, you know, he so often, um, emphasizes that, you know, this is a theory and he doesn't know that it's, you know, he's not, he's not parading it around as some kind of final solution to, you know, to anything. Um, and he's also acknowledging, of course, that, um, there can be no theory of, of everything. Um, but, but what he's done is sort of chiseled away at this problem and sculpted what looks like an, an entirely plausible um, sort of explanation. And I think I think there's a kind of, um, you know, and he, and he often um, talks about these things called pointers, you know, the words, theories, models, these are pointers at something, right? And of course, he mentioned the, um, you know, the classic, um, you know, the, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. And I love that. And I'd never really thought before about the, the idea that that, um, sets out the limits of its own theory, which is, you know, the thing that he's calling for. He's saying, look, you know, you, the, the scientific um, theories and the method has delivered amazing results. And, um, but they're not the final word. Yeah. So Darwin said, we know for a fact that Darwin's theory is not the final word. I mean, the, um, the, do you remember the sort of whole um, Lamarckism thing? You know, the idea that um, traits could be, sort of inherited from previous generations um, because of change, changes in their environment, behavior, and so on and so forth. Well, with epigenetics now, we, we know that, um, you know, uh, th th this is sort of the case. So if, um, <clears throat> you know, if, if, if um, so the parents are particularly hungry, they don't get much food and so on and so forth, we, we, we know that uh, babies can adapt to these these conditions. So it's almost like they know that there isn't much food available. So they, they develop smaller guts and things like that. Um, well, you know, this, I mean, I don't know how well this is, this understood this is, but, um, <clears throat> we just know for a fact that, you know, Darwin isn't the final word, right. On, um, on life and, and humanity and so on and so forth. But, um, so, so back to kind of Donald, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of what he's saying, I suppose I should just sort of try and set that out and, you know, if, if for anybody that wasn't clear on it, because it can be, you know, as, as Donald said, um, you kind of for some of this stuff, you need a stiff drink, <laughs> you know, really to, to, um, kind of calm the note. Cause, cause it is pretty freaky stuff when you think about it, because, you know, we've, we've been raised to believe that we are inside space time, right? We, we, we've been, you know, that's the model, that's the prevailing paradigm in physics. And it's kind of trickled down into mainstream understanding. And, 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 and it also is the way we're set up to understand the world, right? You know, if mammals were, uh, you know, if, if mammals were kind of evolved to think they're living in some sort of, sort of infinite universe, they, they would never bother doing perhaps never, you know, their, their behaviours would change if they knew what reality really was, right? It's the fact that they see themselves as individuals, <coughs> you know, sort of disconnected from everything else and, um, you know, independent. And it's, be, it's because of the, uh, the, the wrongness of their interpretation of the world that they survive and reproduce right as donald says you know our uh, our sense uh, in, information isn't 
isn't the truth. It's not homomorphic with what's out there. And I think he's, you know, obviously he's offered up an argument that, that you know, seems to sort of prove that with his evolutionary game theory that, um, you know, you know, there's a question here that sort of says, well, you know, can we formalize mathematically Darwin's theory? Right. And, um, you know, if the answer to that is yes, then, as Donald says, this evolutionary game theory sort of simulation um, shows that entities will just simply will not receive true information about the environment around them. Um, it's just, I mean, for starters, it's too much. <laughs> we sort of blow a fuse kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and secondly, they just don't need it. <clears throat> it would be inefficient. Nature seems to love efficiency. And, you know, there maybe there's a sort of free energy principle um, aspect to this, this kind of, uh, you know, sort of least action. Um, <clears throat> you know, perhaps systems just um, sort of gravitate towards the cheapest kind of interpretation of the world that they can get away with, right? Because every single action of a creature, including its own perceptual process, costs energy. So to listen costs energy, right? Um, so you can't be just, you know, listening clumsily to just absolutely everything that's going on. You've, you know, you have to um, filter out the noise, right? And so this is kind of what perception is. It kind of, um, it's, it's a polymorphic impression of what's going on out there, but, but what's relevant to us, yeah? So, um, so we've, you know, we've been raised to believe that we're the kind of these kind of, um, you know, is isolated, independent sort of entities wandering around a rock in space. And Donald's kind of turning that on its head completely and just saying, well, no, that's what things appear to us as. Um, but the things in themselves, you know, and again, this is sort of Kantian language, because, of course, Immanuel Kant, many moons ago, um, sort of wrote a book called Critique of Pure Reason. And in those extremely dense, um, almost sort of, um, you know, intractably complex in places, pages, pages um, he offered up this notion that space and time are just sort of modes of perception, right? So they don't actually, you know, I mean, this is really kind of ahead of his time in a sense. He, he just said that, you know, there's these things in themselves, right, which are beyond human perception, right? Again, so this is kind of what Donald's saying. And we can't ever hope to truly uh, sort of apprehend that their nature or comprehend their nature because, um, it, you know, space and time are just the way human beings sort of see things. Right. And this is this is what Donald's saying. And he's um, his his theory of uh, conscious agents actually includes this kind of mathematical model, um, which he's working on at the moment, this this bridge building from the um, sort of conscious agent mathematics, which I believe is sort of Markovian kernels. So they're kind of like sort of matrices of um, numbers, essentially, I think. And um, and those and those uh, sort of combinations would represent ex certain experiences, right? So the color green or the color blue and combinations thereof and so on, right? And so it kind of, in, in that sense, it sort of reminds me a little bit, or it's sort of, there's surely a dotted line from this to integrated information theory, which I'm slowly but surely kind of beginning to wrap my um, very tired old mind around. Um, so obviously Bernardo Castrop's kind of leading, leading, leading the way in that direction, actually looking to integrated information theory to sort of math, mathematize some of his thinking. So dissociation and things like that, I think, I believe. Um, so, you know, you know, there seems to be um, connections with that, at least, or conceptual connections. Um, but for Donald, you know, he, he he's, um, well, you know, what, what he's saying is that the physicalist neuroscientists and, and various other thinkers, they're assuming that this um, outside world, this extensible, you know, 3D space-time reality, they're assuming that that is real. Right. And we're inside that. Whereas he doesn't assume that. All he assumes is that there are conscious agents. Right. Because that's all we can be absolutely certain of. Right. And um, so he's so he's saying, well, let's let's just try and model um, reality on the basis that the reality consists only of these conscious agents. Right. So he, so he's not adding anything in. He's not um, he, he as he pointed out, um, it, it's more parsimonious if it, it succeeds the test of Occam's razor. Although, there, I mean, there are challenges to Occam's razor, razor as a kind of, you know, as a method for um, exposing frailties in thinking. I mean, you know, there's the sort of counter argument that says actually the world is freaking complex and 
so explanations are going to be complex right um, but you know that that's probably another conversation i mean I, you know it, it is basically true i mean you can just look at the logic on on paper and see it clearly that donald is not introducing any additional ontological um concepts right he's he's just saying look we all we know is is that there is consciousness and so i'm just i'm just going to build a system that's um you know tries to approach uh, you know an uh, you know an explanatory model of that right and so it, it would have to account for the, the 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 way we experience the world yeah and that's what he's talking about so he's saying well you know if we develop this kind of conscious agent mathematics and we can build the kind of conceptual bridge from these markovian kernels through the um decorated permutations and then into the amplitohedra then we can actually make predictions in a particle accelerator based on his conscious agent theory now now if those predictions come through and reinforce his claim or sorry support his claim then what the hell does that you know that that that's that's it isn't it that doesn't that kind of pr well it's it's certainly a very very strong support for the um the vision that he's offering up of the nature of reality and i just think that's absolutely fascinating and um you know, I, I still think that there will be many, many, many detractors, both within Chelsoft and beyond, that just say this is kind of crazy. Um, and I reckon 10 years ago, I would have said exactly the same thing. But when you kind of realise that um, there's been a bunch of philosophers banging on about this type of thing for a long time, sort of Bishop Barclay, you know, Kant, there's an argument that suggests that um, Schopenhauer... Uh, maybe an idealist you know Carl Jung certainly shows idealist um, tendencies and so on you know in his thinking and you know now we've got sort of areas of science so the kind of um, the high energy physics people say well you know the space-time mathematics don't work you know so we have to use these non-spatial geometries these um, you know what did Carl call them these kind of um, I'm sorry no what did Donald call them he called them um, Oh, these kind of monoliths, you know, like on the um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, you know, where the apes gather around this monolith and they, and because it's so unfamiliar to them, something with such mathematical um, precision, you know, an object with such uh, smooth edges and, you know, clean edges and so on and so forth, they, they've not seen anything like that, so they just literally don't know what to do with it, right? And, you know, he's sort of saying the same is kind of true with these high energy physicists. They've, they've got these objects that do brilliant mathematics when they would, and you project from them into this space time realm. And, um, you know, which suggests that you know, there is this reality that you know, projects into space time, but it, it freaking isn't in space time, right? Space time is just our experience of this underlying reality, okay? And this is what I think people sort of find their find it hard to get their heads around um, because this none of this uh, undermines our the, the reality of our being and I think this is this is where people get a bit freaked out they think well hang on a minute if I'm not a real physical body I'm not real you know I'm just like some sort of ghost ghost like spirit or something well I, I don't think that's what Donald's saying he's just saying look you know of course we're we all exist right um, I mean sort of Wittgenstein did a fairly good job of um, dispatching solipsism as a as a possible sort of metaphysic We'll go into that at some point, actually. It's quite interesting. I mean, um, some philosophers re reject that notion. Um, but, it, I mean, it's been very, very briefly, it's called the private language argument. And he suggests that uh, language itself could not exist <clears throat> without um, other agencies. Uh, so, it, there, you know, language does exist. Therefore, there cannot be only one single agent. So, that, you know, that's the, the, that's the broad idea, I think. Um, so, look... Um, so Donald isn't under undermining sort of realism, you know. I mean, the, I suppose I think this is why he's called he's called himself a sort of conscious realist. I mean, I would say that that is almost the equivalent of an idealist, right? Um, because you know, idealists hold that everything is mind. Donald holds that everything is consciousness. For me, those are pretty much equivalent statements, right? And I think it's pretty convincing. I mean, I you know, I, I've um, sort of proclaimed myself as a Sort of might might want to say card carrying idealist perhaps but you know again i'm not 100 percent sure i just think it is the neatest most um parsimonious explanation and it explains stuff like psi phenomena explains near-death experiences the stuff on psychedelics so people um who somehow sort of transcend their own human identity 
and they get this sense of belonging and connectedness and they're no longer sort of dissociated they're no longer you know the deep feeling of love and connection and so on and so forth and uh, sort of glimpses of the great other or the transcendent as as, as you can call it and um so anyway, look, there, there's some initial thoughts on Donald Hoffman. I mean, I think he's really onto something. Again, you know, as, as Donald kept on saying and stressing, you can't have a theory of everything. So this is this is a theory. Um, it looks pretty convincing to me. And it's, it explains a hell of a lot. And I'll perhaps offer up a little bit more sort of detail about why I think that in the next talk. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm curious about other other views on this. Um I mean, you know, Donald has studied the brain. He's a, he's a neuroscientist. He's a, he was an expert on perception, visual perception, and, and you know, the I, I think they even built machines that do this kind of stuff. So he understands very well the relationship between the brain and our experience. He even acknowledges this. And there, there's certain experiments where you hold magnets near certain parts of the brain, and you can um, you can kill off people's color vision in one one eye. So left eye's color, right eye's black and white, things like that. And so he's well aware that there's you can influence. Um, people's experience by mucking around with their brain right um but he still says that's still just correlation so you know um so particles have no causal power all that stuff so when i'm you know if i open up your head and start poking your brain a horrible thought i know but um you know i'm just poking the thing that appears as a brain uh, you know as so so what you know i don't know what that thing is it's another conscious agent and this is how it's you know, central control system appears to me. But it's not really there in some sort of external 3D space-time manifold. Yeah? It's just literally in the eye of the beholder, you know, calling on a, an old phrase there. Um, so, yeah, and okay. Um, I, I think he's a, a freaking genius. And I think he's pulled together a, a, a kind of position based on a number of different disciplines, so sort of physics, evolutionary biology, uh, neuroscience philosophy and you know and this is where the progress comes it seems these days from convergences across different disciplines and from polymathic reasoners i mean i mean carl frist i mean you know he says he doesn't have much philosophical training but i mean the guy is analytically extremely perspicacious and um so is donald and so you know and, and th these guys all have interdisciplinary interests and i think that's where the the fruit is born these days uh, so, so look, yeah, I mean, I think Donald's really onto something. I think he's probably right about this. It certainly suits my view because I'm an idealist. And um, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll do a bit more thinking on this. And um, as I've suggested elsewhere, I'm going to start trying to look. Oh, I keep saying this, but I definitely will start trying to look um, in more detail at these mathematics because it kind of sounds fun. <laughs> anyway, cheers, guys. Speak soon. Bye.